Hello, everyone. Next up, we have Amanda Sopkin presenting the refactoring balance beam, when to make changes and when to leave it alone. All right, thank you very much. Um, welcome to, as he said, the refactoring balance beam. Uh, the inspiration for this title is that when you're refactoring, you're sort of striking a balance between what it's worth making changes to and what you, know, you should just kind of leave well enough alone. And I'm gonna start out with a joke. Um, so you, I'll kind of tell you what's going on in case it's hard to read the print. Uh, basically, this developer has just cloned his master branch. Both of the branches look like monsters. And the master branch is asking about the new branch, and the developer says that it's just a refactoring branch. I'm removing all the bad coding. Uh, and then shortly later on, uh, the master branch is concerned because the refactoring branch has been reduced to a pile of bones, and there's really not much left at all. And he's saying, you'll never do that to the master branch, will you? And the developer is saying, it seems not much is left after all. Um, so maybe you've had this experience while you're refactoring, maybe not. Uh, I found in my career that there are a lot of decisions that get made around refactoring that are kind of difficult to balance, um, like deciding when to do it, how to prevent uh, affecting changes, how to prevent affecting uh, feature code, and even just socially navigating making substantial changes to something that someone else on your team potentially wrote. Um, so I'm hopeful that this talk will give you some guidance on how to make those decisions. And if you're someone who likes to follow along with slides as the talk is going, um, I did tweet them out five minutes ago, or you can go to this short URL, uh, bit.ly slash pycon19. Um, and they'll also put the slides up after all of this is said and done. Um, so I'm gonna start out by talking about some of the motivations for refactoring. We'll spend the meat of this talk kind of looking at different code smells and good ways to address them. And then we'll talk about different approaches to refactoring and uh, ways to answer that question of whether or not you should be doing refactoring. Uh, so I want to start out by putting the Zen of Python up here. Um, you've probably seen this several times this weekend alone, but I think there are a few pieces that are worth calling out to get us into the right head state for a refactoring talk. Um, so in particular, beautiful is better than ugly, explicit is better than implicit, simple is better than complex, readability counts, there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. And if the implementation is hard to explain, it's a bad idea. Um, so I think these are good guiding philosophical ideas as we go through our refactoring journey. Uh, the definition of refactoring from Wikipedia is sufficient in my opinion. Uh, code refactoring is the process of restructuring existing computer code without changing its external behavior. Um, so I've highlighted without changing, if you're refactoring something, you're not adding, or at least the point is not to add additional features. Uh, the point is to hopefully make it more understandable. So why do we refactor? The purpose is to increase understanding and hopefully reach a more enlightened state, both for you, the person writing it, and then also for future people who will look at this code and add to it. Um, so keep that purpose in mind. If the refactoring is making it more complicated, then we've sort of failed somewhere along the way. A uh, couple other terms that I'll be using that I want to define. Um, a design pattern is just a repeatable solution to a software engineering problem. Um, and early in my career, I used to think that design patterns were something like those sewing patterns that they sell like at Walmart, um, where you've got these complicated diagrams and like all these weird names, and it's hard to keep track of them. Uh, but I think a better analogy is more like a box of tools. Um, so it really doesn't matter if you know the names for design patterns. Uh, there's no final exam here. Uh, they're just a set of tools that you probably already use pretty frequently. Um, and if you can get used to that, then it'll be helpful for you as a developer. Uh, code smell is defined as a characteristic in the source code of a program that possibly indicates a deeper problem. Um, so if it's something, that, it's something that if you see this happening, it's a good clue that maybe you should look a little bit closer and see if there's something that you should change. Um, before we get started refactoring, I want to issue a warning that you should have a rollback strategy. Um, particularly if you're working with live code, uh, it's very possible that you'll make changes, even if you're just renaming something, that will have unforeseen consequences on your production code. Um, so make sure you have some way to roll those changes back and preferably also like a test suite that you can use to make sure that you haven't broken anything. Uh, so some of the basic tools that we have at our disposal, um, renaming, that's a really good way to make things more readable, 
moving or splitting things in general, and redefining inheritance boundaries are some of the big tools that we'll be using to refactor. And I'm gonna go over some code smells, and they basically fit into three different buckets. Um, first of all, when something is too long or too complex. Uh, second of all, if it's not useful enough, not really doing enough for us. And third of all, if you've got some bad object-oriented programming going on. Um, and none of this means that anyone really did anything wrong. It might just be that the decision made sense at the time, and now in retrospect, it doesn't really make sense anymore. Um, so the basic ways that we'll address these problems, uh, if it's too long, we'll split it out. If it's not useful enough, then we'll compress it or put it somewhere else. Um, and if there's bad object-oriented programming going on, we'll restructure it somehow. Uh, so quick note on code smells. Just because there's a code smell does not mean that you need to change anything or even that anything is necessarily wrong. Um, there are patterns that often indicate that something could have been done better. But there are times when it's totally okay to have a code smell. So I just want to point that out. Uh, so the first common bucket for code smells that we're going to look at is when something is a little too long. And I also want to say that these are going to start out kind of simple, but they'll build on each other. Um, so don't worry, it'll get more interesting. So the first one that we see pretty frequently uh, is when you have duplicated code. Uh, so you're doing the same thing in several different places. This is a good clue that you should pull that out into a method or potentially a class. And if you're pulling something into a class, at this point, I feel like I should ask you and you should Ask yourself, uh, do you really need another class? Because that's a frequent cause of other code smells. Um, so when you're kind of deciding whether or not you need a new class for this or whether you can just use a method, um, there are a couple of things you can do to make that decision easier. Uh, so you should create a class if you have something that looks like this, where you have, a similar, you have some similar arguments that are being used in multiple functions and a mix of mutable and immutable. Um, so in this example, I'm initializing a grid structure, and then I'm passing that grid. Sometimes I'm making changes to it. Uh, for check for winner, I'm not making a change. So this is a pretty good indication that it'd be useful for me to use a class. Um, in this case, it's probably better to use a function. Um, you've got only two methods here, one of which is doing initialization and then a second one. And you've only got only static methods. Um, so really, this will work just as well as a method. We've got a calculator class where we're initializing two operands and one operator. And really, we can just do this as a function where we pass those in directly, perform the operation, and then return it. Uh, next code smell I want to talk about is long methods. And in this case, when I say the word long, there's no like perfect cutoff point when you know that whatever you've written has too many lines. It's really more about the complexity of whatever it is. So I think a good guiding principle is that if you can't come up with a single cohesive purpose for your method, um, or even like a good name that really encompasses what it's doing, you might need to split out some functionality. Um, but in general, you shouldn't just like copy and paste pieces just because it looks a little too long to you. Uh, so we've talked about extract class and extract method. Uh, a couple other things you can do to dock to your code. You can replace method with method object. Um, so here I've got a procedure where I'm passing in a bunch of different variables and doing a lot of computations. It's several lines long, so maybe I want to pull aspects of that out. Uh, in this case, it might be a good idea to introduce uh, a method or a class where I can store the, that data and then pretty easily break it up into smaller pieces. Another thing we can do is introduce a parameter object. Um, so if you have frequent groups of parameters that you're using together, like in this example, we've got start time and end time, then it might be a good idea to pull, to create an object, uh, in this case it's called time range, to encompass those parameters. The next code smell I want to talk about is called data clumps. Uh, this happens if you've got frequent clumps of data appearing throughout your code. Uh, in this case, it might make it better to pull that clump into an object. Uh, and I want to point out that there is a reciprocal code smell for this one that we'll talk about later. So for a lot of these, you can take an action, and, and if you take it too far, then you might end up introducing a new code smell. Um, so keep in mind that it's a balance. The next big bucket of code smells we'll talk about is when something is not quite useful enough. Um, so the most common one is a lazy class or a speculative generality. This usually happens if when I set out to create my project, I thought I was going to have you know, a bunch of parent classes and subclasses, and maybe I went a little overboard in creating those. Uh, and then later on, when I look at it, I see that a lot of those classes aren't doing anything for me. 
Um, so as an example, let's say I have an employee parent class uh, where that has a name and a salary associated with it. And then I've got an engineer, which is a subclass of employee, and an engineer has a team. And maybe when I created these, I thought I was going to have lots of different kinds of employees that were going to need their own information. Maybe only engineers would have teams and uh, executives wouldn't have teams or something like that. But now that I'm looking at it, it seems like employee isn't really doing anything for me. Um, so there's no shame in that. I'll just lift that value into the employee class. And now employee can have a concept of a team. Uh, the next code smell is the reciprocal of the data clumps code smell that we talked about earlier. Um, so this happens if you end up with a lot of classes that are doing nothing but storing data. Um, so if this happens, and it's happening in a lot of places, uh, the best thing you can do is probably try and find methods that are often associated with those clumps of data so that your class can be a little bit more useful for you. Um, and again, just because this is happening doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It might be appropriate to have at least a few data holders. But if it's happening pretty frequently, then you might want to look into it a little bit more. Um, so now we're going to get to uh, the third most complicated and most interesting bucket of code smells, which was related to issues with object-oriented programming. Um, so the first one I'll talk about is divergent change. Uh, this happens if one class is being changed a lot for different reasons. Uh, often this is kind of unavoidable to some extent. But if possible, each object should only be changed as a result of one kind of changes. Um, a kind of similar code smell, and my favorite name for a code smell is shotgun surgery. Uh, this happens when every time you make a change, you find that you have to make changes in a bunch of different places. And suddenly, your code kind of looks like a trauma victim. Um, so this can be made better by trying to encapsulate those changes in a particular place. Um, so to go through an example, let's say that I've got a bank. And those banks have offices. And then I've also got some type of financial regulating authority. Um, and my bank is doing really well. So I'm having to introduce new kinds of currency uh, when I go into a new area. And I find that every time I have to do that, I have to make changes in all three of these places. Um, so this is a good clue that maybe I want to pull those into one currency handler so that every time I'm adding a new currency, which potentially is something I'm doing a lot, I only have to make that change in one place. Um, a similar code smell is called parallel inheritance hierarchies. Uh, this happens when every single time you make a subclass of one hierarchy, you're finding that you have to make it in another place as well. Um, so as an example, let's say that I manage small businesses, and I've got a dentist and a primary care office, and I have to create a payment manager class for both of those. And then I find that I have to split out insurance functionality, so I find myself having to create that subclass again in both of those places. Um, so I'm, if I'm having to do that a lot, it's a good clue that maybe I want to centralize those and maybe have one single finance handler that can handle both of those for each of these different subclasses. Uh, next code smell I want to talk about is called feature envy. This happens if you've got an object that's kind of reaching in very frequently to another class. Uh, and it's very similar to inappropriate intimacy, which happens when classes know more about each other than they probably should. Um, so as an example, let's say I've got an entree class, and I'm reaching into this junk food class pretty frequently to do things like get the calorie content for my entree, um, find out how much sugar is in it. And a good clue here that something is messed up is the names, because an entree isn't necessarily junk food. Um, so it probably makes more sense to pull those functions out into a nutrition info provider so that both my entree and my junk food can access it. Uh, the next code smell is somewhat visual. Uh, this happens when you've got a lot of different switch statements. Uh, and generally, the way that we address this is by taking those switch statements out into a method, finding a class where we can store that method, and then attempting to extract what we're switching upon into state. Um, so for example, if you're switching on employee type, you could create employee type as a class and then use that to figure out which employee you're looking at. Next code smell is called message chains. Uh, this happens if you have one client that has to keep asking an object about another object, and then maybe this object about another object, and so on and so forth. Um, so there are a couple ways to address that, but the one I want to talk about is called hide delegate. Um, so let's imagine that I have a client, and it needs to figure out, it's reaching into an object to figure out a person, and then to figure out the department that that person belongs to. It has to go to the department, and maybe it's looking at both person and department. Sometimes it looks at department to get the manager. 
um, and that can be kind of confusing. Um, so ideally, the client should only have to have knowledge of one of those, so we can hide this delegate by having the client interact only with person, which will interact on its own with department. Um, and the reciprocal code smell here is called middleman, which happens when you've got a bunch of classes that are only acting as delegates. So if that happens, you probably need to go through and delete some along the way. Uh, this code smell has uh, probably the most complicated name. Uh, this happens, it's called refused bequest, and basically it just means that a child class doesn't need everything that it's inheriting. Um, so as a general guideline, if a child should need everything that its parent is giving it, and if it does not, the best thing you can probably do is push down some of that functionality into a sibling class. Um, and this is getting into an important concept here, which is the difference on the trade-offs between inheritance and composition. Um, and there's enough material here to go into another talk. Uh, in fact, there was a talk about this same subject yesterday, so I'm not going to go into it too much, uh, but basically you want to ask yourself, do I need to inherit all of the things this parent can do? And if not, is it better to just contain the specific functionality I need? Uh, so the basic smells or the basic categories of smells that we've looked at are when something is too long, we split it out. If it's not useful enough, we need to compress it or move the functionality. Uh, and if we've got bad object-oriented programming, we're restructuring. Um, so now I want to talk about specific code smells for Python. Uh, so the first one, and I guess this isn't necessarily specific to Python, uh, is extremely nested code where you've got a lot of if statements. Uh, in Python, often there are things you can do to rip that out entirely. So like, for example, if you're looking at a list and doing a lot of boundary checking, often you can just use an iterator and avoid doing all of that. Um, but I am going to go through a longer demo for one of these in a couple of minutes. So we'll come back to this. Uh, unnecessary boilerplate code. This happens if you've got a class that's basically just storing a bunch of data and maybe overriding a couple of things. Um, so if this happens, you're probably reinventing the wheel a little bit. So as an example, let's say that I've got this math method, or this math object, and I'm storing a bunch of variables, and then I'm redefining the wrapper method and the string method. Um, so if I'm doing this, the odds are that I could use something else. Uh, in particular, I could do this with a data class, where I pass in all the variables I need and their types, and then it'll redefine wrapper and string for me. Or I could use an adder, um, kind of a similar concept here. The next Python code smell I want to talk about is when your exception handling is too tightly coupled to your business logic. Um, so in general, we like those to be kind of separate because it's just easier to read and nicer to deal with. Uh, so if this happens, then hopefully you can push down your exception handling, maybe like in a try and accept uh, block. And the last Pythonic specific code smell I'll talk about is if you're repeating setup and tear down auctions frequently. Um, so if this is happening, you might want to introduce a context manager, which you would usually call using the with method. Great, so now I said I would do a demo of a longer example with nested if statements. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. And I will point out what's important, so if you can't read this or see it, hopefully that'll be okay. Uh, so let's say that I'm building a restaurant menu, and I want to be able to decide what the menu looks like at a given night. And I'm going to base that off of what ingredients were freshly available at the market in a given day. Um, and let's also say, so these are the basic things I can make at my restaurant. Um, it's very basic. Uh, I can make pizza with bread and sauce. I can make grilled cheese with cheese and bread, fish, cheese and fish, and then steak. Um, so very simple options here. And let's say I want to vary my menu based on season. Um, so now I have to look at the ingredients I have available and the season that I'm in to decide a menu. Um, and let's also say that I'm very frugal, I want to increase my profit margin, so I only want to offer the customer the cheapest thing that I'm capable of making. Um, so let's say I just kind of like puke this logic into code. I might end up with something that looks like this. Uh, you don't have to read it. Basically, I'm just going through and looking at the season and then figuring out if I can make the first cheapest option for that season. And if I can, I return that. And then I go to the next option and so on and so forth. Um, and you have to read it a couple of times to really parse what's going on. Um, so obviously, this is a good candidate for refactoring. But before we do that, I want to show what will happen if we have to add functionality. Um, so let's say that now I need to track whether or not my customer ordered an alcoholic drink with their order. And let's say there's a law that mandates that if I'm ordering an alcoholic drink, I have to eat an entree that has protein in it. 
Um, so now I need to keep track of whether or not they ordered a drink, the season I'm in, and the ingredients that I have available. Um, so if I just add this parameter to all of the statements where I need it, um, that's how that looks. I have to make that change in a lot of different places. And now my logic's getting even worse and harder to look at, uh, which is bound to happen when you have code that needs to be refactored. Um, so first thing I'm going to do here is switch to using a list of menu items. So rather than returning the first available cheapest option, we will put the cheapest option in first and then return a list that's sorted by uh, the cheapest available entree to the most expensive. Um, so here I'm just adding a list and then appending to it before I return. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is pull out this kind of icky logic into methods. Um, for two reasons. First of all, because it'll make it the if statements more descriptive. And second of all, because as a rule, these statements are going to get more complicated, not less. Um, so just a couple of things to point out here. I have a menu class where I am mapping each entree to the ingredients that compose it. And then I'm going through and I'm just figuring out if I can make each one of those entrees. And if I can, then that's a possible dish for that night. And if my person has ordered a drink, then I know that I can only use entrees from the proteins list. Um, so now I have a series of methods where I can get the menu according to a season based on what entrees are available in that season. Um, and now my logic is a lot cleaner to look at. Um, I just check what season I'm looking at and then get the menu for that particular season. The next thing I'm going to do is pull these functions into methods um, for a few different reasons. First of all, so I can kind of pre-compute the menu for that night rather than doing it in each if statement. I'm going to override the bool method so that I can easily check which menu to use. And then mainly, really, the third reason is it'll make my unit tests easy because now I can just create this object and kind of spot check a couple of things rather than having to like look at the menu and check that certain things were called internally. Um, so now I'm adding a concept of season to my menu. And I have uh, subclasses that store the options for that particular night and a bool method, which will tell me if I'm looking at the right season. So now my code looks like this. I check to see if it's appropriate to use the summer menu. And if it is, I grab that menu. Uh, this code is still not perfect. I could be returning directly for starters rather than grabbing the menu since I will only be in one season at a time. Uh, but this is where we're going to leave it for now. So I want to point out a few things. Um, first of all, don't add your functionality while you're refactoring. You want to do that before you refactor or after you've refactored everything. If you try to do them both simultaneously, um, it'll probably be a bad time. Uh, you want to make changes incrementally. And then if you can, hopefully verify that your tests continue to pass as you're going. Uh, and remember that making progress is better than ending up with perfect code. Uh, so when you're refactoring, it's pretty easy to go down this rabbit hole where you're like, OK, I need to change this, so this class should really be like this, and now I need a new class here, and kind of end up changing everything. And it's better to just make progress incrementally rather than getting yourself into a mess or rewriting all of the code. So how are we going to do the refactoring? A um, few different strategies. Test-driven development. If you have good tests, then run them repeatedly to make sure things still pass between changes. And if not, create the tests that you wanted and then refactor until they pass. Litter pickup, if you want to do it incrementally along the way. Um, so some small things that you can do, add a wrapper for debugging, delete, or migrate unused functionality. And then one that we do on my team, if you have a comment that indicates that something was not clear enough to stand by itself. So if you can refactor to make it stand alone and then remove the comment, that's an easy thing to do. Uh, comprehension, if you want to start by understanding the code and then take that understanding and put it into the code so the next person has an easier time. Preparatory, if you want to refactor so that you can do something else later. Um, planned, which happens if you have to actually schedule out the refactoring, which probably means that you waited a little too long. Um, and red-green refactoring, which is very similar to test-driven development, where you create the tests that you want, and then they will fail, and then you kind of refactor until they pass. Um, so now I want to throw a wrench in this. Uh, what if we need to maintain backwards compatibility? And I'll do this quickly. Um, let's say we're going to use an expand contract pattern. So we have the old code. We'll add the new code alongside it. And then we'll contract to just the new code. Um, so in Python, we can split classes by passing in optional parameters and then issue warnings in the old code path. So as an example, if I have a Cheeto class with a name, and amount, and a cost, and then I start to add parameters to it, like spiciness and kind of cheese, then I decide to lift some of that into a parent class called snack. 
Um, so now I have two different code paths. If I'm passing in my snack parent class, then I'll use that. And if not, I'll accept parameters to build it myself. And then I also want to issue a warning in the second case to tell the person that they should be using the refactored version. Great, so now back to that same question, to refactor or not. Um, when to not refactor? If you can add better documentation instead. Um, so if that's possible to just document an endpoint, might want to do that. Um, if you're just showing off by showing that you can do like a 360 deluxe prototype um, refactor, then that's probably not a great idea and it won't make your coworkers like you more. Uh, and if you need to rewrite it from scratch, then you might not even bother refactoring. Um, so in general, good reasons to refactor. If you've regretted not doing this before, um, if no one on the team has any idea what this does anymore, then it's a good idea, then you can be that person who kind of works in understanding and then puts that into the code. Um, and then if refactoring this code now will definitely make it easier to change later on, those are all good reasons to refactor. Um, and remember that our mantra here when it comes to refactoring is progress, not perfection. Um, so we're trying to make progress with the code that we're writing, and in fact, it's better to start with a smaller change so that everyone can kind of get used to how this works rather than rewriting everything all together, and now you might end up with the same issue where there's only one person who understands how all of this works. Um, so I want to say that I, a lot of the code smells, most of the code smells in this talk are from the book Refactoring, which is written by Martin Fowler. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about code smells or design patterns, uh, then that's an excellent place to start. And um, if you take anything away from this talk, first of all, if you get the sense that there's a code smell here, so if your spidey senses are sort of starting to tingle um, and you feel like there's something wrong, then pay attention to that feeling or that instinct, and it'll probably get sharper as you go on in your career. Um, that means that there's something that's worth looking into. Uh, and it's not a hard and fast rule. If there's a code smell, that doesn't mean that something necessarily has to change, but it is worth paying attention to. Uh, remember that the true meaning of refactoring is to arrive at a better understanding, ultimately, and something that is easier to maintain. Um, so if you've done a lot of refactoring and it ends up more complicated, that means that something went amiss along the way. Um, and try and think about your strategy for refactoring before jumping in. Um, so at a minimum, this means having a rollback strategy and hopefully some kind of test suite that you can use to make sure you didn't break anything. Um, but it also means being deliberate about how you do the refactoring. Um, so taking the time to say, okay, if I refactor this piece, then I need to have backwards compatibility here, so I'm gonna do that, and then I'll work on this piece um, and kind of break it up in a thoughtful way so that you don't just dive in and kind of get yourself into a quandary where you're not able to change anything anymore. Um, great, so thank you for coming. Um, I tweeted out these slides, and I'm not gonna be doing open Q&A, so if you do want to talk, happy to discuss this or look more code smells, feel free to tweet at me or come talk to me in person. Um, and thank you, have a good rest of your PyCon.